It's time for another section. This one on uh, virtual memory is uh, going to be a very important one for, uh, for the course uh, because virtual memory is a critical component of uh, modern computers that allows, us to th uh, to allows our programs to take advantage of the huge address space we can provide. Uh, especially with a 64-bit address, uh, but still realize things on the limited amount of memory that we have. A as always with our sections, we're going to start off with uh, a, a quick overview and motivation for the topic, um, and then we'll get into some of the details of how virtual memory is uh, actually implemented, how it serves as a great tool uh, for caching at a, at a different level than the caches we've already looked at, and how it helps with memory management and protection. Uh, finally, we'll conclude with uh, a detailed example of virtual, virtual memory in action. Okay, so you'll remember uh, from the last section that a process is uh, an instance of a running program. It is a really important idea in computer science, and uh, there's two key abstractions that uh, a process model provides. And that is one of logical control flow that, namely, that each process seems to have full control of the CPU. It does everything it needs to do and doesn't really worry about other processes that are running. That's what we learned about in the, in the, in the previous section, uh, how we can interleave multiple processes and so on. The other uh, key abstraction that a process provides is that uh, it lets the programmer think about their process or their program running in that process as having its own private address space. Uh, an address space that is huge, uh, 64 bits of addressing, and again, exclusive use of that memory. Now, that's not really true, of course, because we're going to be running multiple processes on the same processor. They're all going to want to use memory. So this is not going to be uh, a, a perfect exclusive use. And then in addition, uh, we're going to have a, a much larger virtual memory than a physical memory uh, that we can really realize in the, CP, in, in the computer system. So uh, virtual memory is going to help us with both of these things, uh, exclusive use and a huge virtual memory, uh, even when we have a small one. So let's take a look at uh, what we know about virtual memory uh, so far. Uh, so programs refer to addresses in memory, and these are really virtual memory addresses. So every time we write an instruction like this and use an address, in this case an address stored in the register ECX, remember the parentheses tell us to go to that address in memory and get the value stored there, uh, move it to a register in this case. All right, what we're really doing is going to a 64-bit address, which may or may not exist physically in a particular uh, place in memory, but exists virtually in that we have this huge array of bytes. Each byte has its own address, and uh, the system is going to provide uh, a private address space for each one of our uh, processes. Okay. The compiler and the runtime system are going to worry about how to allocate stuff in memory. We've seen this already uh, to, a, uh, to a certain extent. We'll see a little bit more uh, later on. But basically, um, the compiler is deciding where different program objects should be stored in that large array of memory and uh, where data should be stored and so on. So what problems does uh, virtual memory solve that physical memory uh, doesn't uh, solve for us? Okay, so the first problem is that uh, how does everything fit? We have this huge address space, 64-bit addresses, 16 exabytes of data. We don't have computers with that much physical memory. The physical memory we have is a tiny, tiny amount compared to that uh, address space. Uh, so how do we fit all of this stuff that could be uh, in here for our programs into this tiny little space? Clearly, we can't fit it all in at the same time. We're going to have to decide what to put in when. Uh, and uh, that is one of the important things uh, that virtual memory is going to do for us. Another aspect is that we have multiple processes, each one of them thinking they have that huge address space. Uh, each one of them has a bunch of things in memory, its stack, its heap, its uh, program, and its data, static data. 
And what is going to go where in the physical memory, that little piece of physical main memory? How are we going to fit it in there? And how are we going to multiplex between all of these so that when one process is running, its memory is available in physical me main memory, and when a different process is running, its memory is available. Uh, and those have to be kept separate and distinct. So we're going to want to protect uh, one process from another in that if one process has a portion of memory uh, that it uses, we don't want to have another process write to that uh, and maybe clobber data uh, that the first process needed. Okay, So we got to keep these uh, separate from each other and protect them from each other's interactions. And then uh, the flip side of that is that we also may want to share memory sometimes. For example, suppose that we have a chunk of memory that represents a shared library of code. Uh, so quick example, right, those printf and scanf routines that are uh, commonly used by C programs. Uh, we don't want to have to put those in memory multiple times. Uh, so we'd like processes to be able to share those pieces, uh, especially if they're read-only. Right, uh, that we're not uh, writing new values to those locations. So this is an important aspect of sharing parts of memory and making it uh, more efficient for the small physical memory uh, to handle many processes.